Now, I am excited about it. Again, I reminded the folks this morning, we don't have themes for themes' sake. We pray and I seek what God has for us and what needs we have, what direction we may need to go, and just what would bless our hearts as we stay focused on a few thoughts uh, throughout the year. And so 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 20 says, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. And the key verse, if. A man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Summarized in one word, it'd be prepared. But that passage has so many things in it, that verse has so much, we're talking about prepared. Three facets, three facets in our theme, three facets in the verse, three facets to be focused on. One, as I said this morning, good works. It is a work, and it's a good work. That's the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's our soul winning and missions outreach. Our vision, bring a spiritual awakening to the East Bay, and our mission to deploy and develop 21st century disciples and see them have an impact. So the good work, that's what we're focused on, unto every good work. And so we've got the good works, then we've got the preparation, prepared. We have to prepare. We have to do our best. We have to learn. A lot of times folks aren't involved in ministry because they feel like they just don't know how or what to do. We want to make sure that we're prepared. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. So we'll be talking this year about being prepared for every good work. That means being prepared practically. We'll have some training for soul winning. We'll have some training about Sunday school, different courses and meetings to help us grow, grow in our ministry, grow in our ability to work and serve for God. And then prepared spiritually, which is the key about the vessels, vessels unto honor, that we would be prepared spiritually for the work also. Uh, the idea is, the goal is that you and I will begin now to prepare our hearts and our lives to be vessels of honor participate in the good work God has for us. So prepared unto every good work. Very quickly, let's go over the goals. If we're ready for the goals up there, very simple goals and some things that will help us and be challenged. So we'll be looking at these over the next 12 months. First one is some number goals, number goals, and just some numbers we want to see increase uh, besides seeing souls saved increase and baptisms increase because we, we could set a goal for souls, but we don't save anybody. We can't tell how many get saved, but we can work, set work goals and say, God, here's my work. Here's what I'm doing. These are the goals we want to put into practice so God can bless and send the souls. But we want to find, first of all, some number goals. We want to see an increase in soul winning and outreach participation, basically a, a, a measure, if you will, of our Sunday morning crowd number versus how many going out soul winning. We want to see that increased. Amen? So everybody's more involved. So we want to see an increase in soul winning and outreach participation. We want to see an increase in service and ministry involvement. Again, comparing our Sunday morning numbers with the people actively involved. We want to see that increase and get everybody involved. How many believe God wants all his people involved in the work? Amen. So that's a goal. We want to see that work. Then we want to increase our one-on-one -on -one discipleship completions and see that go forward. Then we have some ministry goals, and these are exciting always. Some ministries, first of all, to start. Some things we want to start. We want to start Men of Lighthouse, a good, solid men's ministry. Well, we need some men that are plugged in, plugged in with God and plugged in with the church and building one another and being the men God would have us to be in our church. Churches, we praise the Lord for the ladies in our church and what we would we couldn't do without them. But men, we've got to be plugged in and more leaders in that. So we want to establish a good men's ministry, a Lighthouse Baptist youth, uh, Young Adults. And uh, so we want to see our young folks have a, a focus direction as well as activities, but also be able to reach their demographic and be able to be built up and discipled. So we want to start a young, uh, young adult class and ministry. And then the shuttle and valet parking. Uh, again, when, especially when the city does its things down there, we have no parking here. And for us, I know I've already told you, how many go to Costco? I guarantee it, you've walked farther from your car in Costco to into the Costco building than anybody's ever had to walk to church here. But somehow it's different because it's church. Somehow it's different because it's uphill or whatever. So we want to get an opportunity to shuttle as many people as we can from places around. We've already had an agreement in the past 
with the school just a couple of blocks away that we can use them and shuttle back and forth, shuttle folks so they don't have to walk. They can drop folks off here and the drivers can go there, all our key folks. So we want to get that uh, restarted, if you will, or started. Now, ministries to restart, things that really need to get on course again is our bus ministry. We've got to get that going. Boys and girls underneath the sound of the gospel, reaching our communities, reaching our areas. So we want to get that restarted. The rest home ministry, seeing that restarted again. Uh, folks there in their latter years, they need to hear the gospel. They need ministry. By the way, if you've never been involved in a rest home ministry, you spoke about it this morning. It is a blessing. Uh, it's an amazing thing. People, many times, they're not cared for anywhere. No family comes. Many of those folks are saved, and they know the gospel. They know the hymns. It's amazing to see their eyes light up and just brighten up when you start singing the old hymns and uh, how they can sing it. So we want to reestablish, restart our rest home ministry and then restart our men and ladies pre-service prayer meetings, uh, getting them together before the evening service on Sunday and before Wednesday night and just praying. So uh, want to restart that. And then some ministries to reset. In other words, we've got them, but boy, we've got to put some more energy into it. That, of course, is our soul winning uh, ministry, our outreach, provide training. Got some uh, varied formats of approach on how we might reach our community and how we might structure it and get people involved in a little unique way, still door to door, still doing the door hangers, still doing that, but maybe a little of different approach on a quarterly basis. But we'll be looking at that, reset that, and doing some tracking. Our care calling, oh, we need, that's so important. I know folks don't understand unless they get those care calls. How you doing this week? What do we need, can we pray you about, for you about? Uh, any health issues? That's such an important thing. So we need to reset those. Then very quickly, some member goals or goals for us is we want to become vessels of honor. And that means you have to pause and look at your own spiritual life, your own spiritual walk, and be those vessels of honor. Uh, want to learn what that means and let God help us reach that. We want everybody, as far as a ministry goal, to participate in at least one ministry of, with the theme, good works. And whether that be working in the yard, whether it be cleaning a part of the building, whether it be being an usher, being in the choir, but everybody have a weekly place. It's so important to have a weekly place of ministry. If it's just an occasional thing, uh, you will never feel like you're plugged in. It'll never fully be your church, but having a regular weekly place. So we want to see that uh, as a goal for our people. And then participate in Lighthouse Baptist uh, Spiritual Foundations Program. We want to hopefully start that at the first of the year. We're talking about those foundational habits, habit of prayer. A lot of people pray sometimes. A lot of people read their Bibles sometimes. But we're talking about getting those good habits, and we're looking at a way to do some training, provide some tools to help you with that and accountability, and just keep track of that. So we want folks in there to get those spiritual habits down. So we want to see that help us then as we then become prepared as vessels of honor to every good work. All those ministry goals are those fine, but it means we need vessels. Vessels. So my prayer is we say, boy, I want to be that vessel unto honor, prepared for every good work. Yeah, I'll tell you what, that's, that's good music, isn't it? Amen. You know, we have a lot of churches today that are trying to take new songs and and fresh songs and these, these uh, contemporary artists and trying to bring it into the Baptist church. And there's no place for that in the Baptist church. And I, I tell you what, uh, you don't need those fresh new songs to bring people to church, amen? The old stuff still works. The old time religion still works, doesn't it? And I tell you what, there's, there's nothing better uh, than hearing songs like that. Just, just so good to my heart. And uh, my wife and I are excited to be here. And we're excited that you're here on a Sunday night. Two things are for sure that I know. Uh, about you being in church, or two things matter, I should say, your presence and your participation. Your presence and your participation are, are two keys for you to be here. If you're present and you participate, hey, it makes a difference to those around you, doesn't it? Now, I remember when I was, I was in Bible college, and, and I'm going to confess a sin. Is that okay? Can I do that? And uh, I hope so, right? And, and I tell you what, we, uh, I was a bus captain. Um, on the south side of Chicago. I went to Hiles Anderson. Can I say that here too? Okay. I went to Hiles Anderson College and I had a bus ride on the south side of Chicago. Well, one day on a Wednesday afternoon, uh, we were, uh, me and a couple guys, we were going to celebrate one of our friend's birthdays. And so we said, you know what? We're going to go to a White Sox game. They're pretty terrible. I think tickets were $2 that day. And so we said, hey, you know what? I can afford that. 
So, you know, let's go. We put in our passes, and, and we, we skipped class, and we took off, and we went to this game. It was about 1 o'clock in the afternoon was the start of the game, and so, you know, as religious as I was thinking I was, I said, you know what, 1 o'clock, probably be done by 4, 4.30. You know, we can make it to church tonight. Uh, what we didn't account for was traffic, rush hour traffic. And so, you know, we, we leave the ballpark. It's about 4, 4.30, and we get in traffic, and, and we, we say, you know, I don't think we're going to make it. I mean, we're still about an hour from the church. And so one of the most spiritual guys said, you know what, let's just go downtown and throw around this football in my trunk. And I said, you know what, that, that sounds fun. So we went downtown, and, and you know, we're, we're at the Millennium Park down there. We're throwing the football. We're playing, uh, you, you know, some football. And, you know, didn't really think it was a big deal. And we go to chapel the next day, and the president of the college gets up, and he starts reading this list. And, I, you know, as he's getting through about the fourth or fifth name, I say, that sounds, that list is starting to sound familiar to me, you know. I heard my name on that list. And he said, I need to see all these men in my office after chapel today. And I said, brother, why do you have to do that at the beginning of chapel? Because I'm not going to get anything out of God's word today. And we go, we go to his office. He said, did you guys go to a baseball game last night? And of course, there's always that one guy who says, no. I'm thinking, you're just making this worse, aren't you? And he says, oh, really? He pulls out his phone. And one of the guys that we went with, posted a video on social media of us throwing a football around the time of church. I'm thinking, look, it's one thing to do something wrong. It's another thing to show everybody that we were doing wrong. And you know what I learned that day that my presence and my participation matters in church, right? Like I need to be where I'm supposed to be. And this is where we ought to be. And, and when you're here, excuse me, when you're not here, people notice, don't they? You know, your pastor notices, and those around you notice, hey, where was so-and-so today? Where was so-and-so today? And I tell you what, it sure does make a difference. Well, like I said, we're so glad to be here. My name's Zach. It's my wife. Anna, I will make her stand. She's very introverted. She doesn't like attention. And so let me talk about, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, she went to Golden State uh, Baptist College. Uh, we met through a mutual friend. Uh, she had come out to Hiles Anderson to, to hang out with one of her friends, and and as she saw me walking through the back of chapel, it was over. My good looks, my, my intelligence, you know, I'm just kidding. You know, and she just could not resist. And she needed her daily dose of me in her life. And no, I'm just kidding. But uh, it was probably the other way around, I would imagine, right? And, and so from there, we began talking. And uh, we did long distance for about a year. And I decided it was too expensive to fly to California every two or three months. And so I said, enough of this. And so a year to the date that we started uh, talking, I guess. Uh, I flew out, I surprised her, uh, and I proposed to her, and then we got married last May. And uh, we had been in Albuquerque, New Mexico uh, for the last two years, working at a Christian school over there. And I, I had enough of middle school, and so I said, I got to get out of here. And so, uh, you know, enough of the 100, 100 degree weather, and I couldn't do it. And so we came out to California, been helping her dad. Uh, Pastor Lamus uh, in Salinas, California, and so we've been revamping his Facebook ministry, uh, bulletins and banners, and, and really just trying to give the, the uh, church a shot in the arm, and just trying to help him further his ministry there, and so we're, we're enjoying it. Uh, I, I'm, you know, we always have the argument of, you know, what do you like more, the beach or the mountains? It doesn't matter to me. It's all God's creation, amen, all right? It doesn't matter to me. It's all good, all right? It's all good. I can step outside look around and it's all beautiful to me, but some people have a preference and I've had both and it doesn't matter to me, right? I'm, I'm not picky about it. If you have your Bible, I want you to take your Bible to the book of Mark chapter number five tonight. Mark chapter number five. Well, I want to give you a very, very familiar story uh, here and it, to give you just a background of the story, when we look at the end of Mark in chapter number four, right, we see a very familiar story, don't we? We see the story of Jesus uh, calming the storm. We know the story. The disciples are on a boat, and they get on that boat, and in verse 35 of the previous chapter, Jesus comes right out, and he says, hey, all right, fellas, now let us pass over to the other side. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I can assume that, you know, if Jesus said that we're going to get it to the other side, I guess that would uh, help me to assume that we're going to get to the other side, right? And he didn't promise them how they were going to get there. He didn't tell them what was going to happen on the way there. He just said, let us make our way to the other side. And I see this true in our life, don't we? We go through some difficult times. We go through a lot of heartache. And we say, well, where's God? And God's always been there. He just didn't tell you what was going to happen from point A to point B. 
He just said, hey, we're going to make it through. Isn't that a great God that we have? And here we see the disciples here, and Jesus said, hey, let's pass over the other side. And we know the story, this, this storm comes, and it's also very interesting to me because the Bible describes this storm as a great storm of wind. Now, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Iowa, okay? And so you don't get the four seasons out here. We get the four seasons out there. We get winter, spring, summer, uh, extra hot summer, and then we get some fall mix in there. And, you know, when I see rainstorms coming, typically we could see the rain coming. We see the clouds blowing in. When we see a tornado, uh, you know, we could see the cloud forming, and that's the time where we get on our porch with our lawn chairs, and we just watch it go by. And there goes my car. It's okay. Right? And we just see it going by, and I could see the storm coming. Right? But with a, with a windstorm, I can't see that coming, right? You know, you ever had a difficulty in your life, church family, where you didn't exactly see it coming? You think about that. You ever had a trial, difficulty in your life, and it just hits you out of nowhere? You're like, man, where did that come from? And I believe that's kind of what happened to the disciples. Everything was good. You know, they were enjoying the, the boat ride, and all of a sudden that boat started to shake, and they didn't know what to do. And the Bible says that, uh, you know, they run down the bottom of the boat, and where's Jesus? He's doing my favorite thing in the world, bless God. He's sleeping. And he's sleeping, and he's just minding his own business. And, and they come down, and they say, hey, Jesus, Jesus, hey. Uh, we're about to die. Do you not care? And he says, oh, ye of little faith. Where, why, why would you doubt the words that I gave you in verse 35? And he comes down there, and we see that. He says, peace be still. And the Bible says the moment he said that, it was over. And then he begins to rebuke the disciples for their lack of faith. And it's interesting that, you know, the same is true in our life. When we have difficulties and we have trials, why is it so hard for us to just cling to God's promises? Why is it so hard to, to trust God through those difficult times? But yet, that's not where the message is tonight. The message is beginning in chapter 5. A very, very familiar story. We see that after all this has happened, the, Jesus has called to see the, uh, Jesus and his disciples are beginning to land in Gadara. And the Bible says in verse 1, I want you to follow along with me. Let's break down this story verse by verse if we can and understand what's happening here. It says, They came over into the other side of the sea and into the country of the Gadarians. And when he, so talking about Jesus, was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because the, he had often... Uh, excuse me, been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken into pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But, watch this, but when he ran to Jesus afar off, he what? He ran and worshipped him. He ran and he worshipped him. Now, picture this with me if you can tonight. Jesus gets off this boat, and the Bible says the moment that he got off the boat, he says this crazy man's running towards him. Now, I don't, know, I don't know about you. All right, where we live in Salinas, there's crazy guys everywhere. I tell you what, I was pumping gas last week, and I'm, I'm, I, I don't know what I was doing, but I was pumping gas at midnight, and this crazy guy comes up to me, and he looks at me, and he says, hey, you got any spare change? I said, buddy, I'm, I'm so broke, it's a joke. I don't have any money. And he looks at my car, he says, are you sure you don't have any money? I said, buddy, I don't even have money to put the gas in this car. Do you, you see this car? It's like a 19-something. It's old. And so he kind of comes up to me and says, are you sure you don't have any money? I said, buddy, I don't know what you're about to do right now, but I know Kung Fu. No, I'm kidding. And I was getting nervous, and I was like, man, you know, this guy was, was coming up to me. I was scared. But Jesus says here that, you know, I could just picture Jesus just calm. The Bible says that immediately there met him a man out of the tombs. You know what that means? That his dwelling, I want you to see first that his dwelling he lived in the cemetery. Now, there's some weird people out there, and I, I don't know, you might be one of them. I've met some people, they say, you know what, the cemetery is so peaceful to walk through, it's just so great. I'm saying, buddy, you're walking around a bunch of dead people. Stop it. Right? I, I go to a cemetery, I go to see my parents, and even, even going to see my parents, I get a little, a little freaked out. I'm like, uh, you know, it's just kind of weird to me, and, and I don't like it. And the Bible says that this maniac, that's where he lived. You know, with the housing market prices today, I might, be, I might be next living over there. But we see that his dwelling was uh, in a cemetery. 
in a, two, in a, in a graveyard. But not only that, in verse 2 it says that it was a man with a what? With an unclean spirit. You know, that tells me that he was not saved. That tells me that he was not a child of God. And you know what? Tonight, if, if we are not a child of God, if we're not saved, if we don't know that if we were to die today that we were going to heaven, we're living in a graveyard tonight. We're living in a spiritual graveyard tonight. If we don't know that if we died today that we would go to heaven, we're spiritually dead. And you know what the great thing about the God that I serve and the God that we serve is we don't have to live in a spiritual graveyard tonight. You know, God said, for whosoever will may come. Isn't that a great thought? God's not looking for the best looking. He's not looking for the ugliest. He's not looking for the richest. He's not looking for the poorest. He said, whosoever will may come. That's the love of our God tonight. That's a God that loves you and loves me and sent his only son who knew no sin to die on the cross so that, that I could live eternity in heaven. That's the God that we serve tonight. And we ought not live in a spiritual graveyard. But I also see this in verse 3. Who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. So not only did this man live in a graveyard tonight, we see that the people of the country were so scared of this man. You know what they did? The Bible says that they would literally tie him to a tombstone with chains. And they would tie him to where he could not move. And the Bible says that this man, so demon-possessed, so out of his mind, would literally break those chains with his, with his own strength. And the Bible says he would run around the graveyard, run around the tombstone, he would cut himself, he'd cut his arms. And, and how sad is it that we have teenagers today that are so broken, so hurting, and, and, and so seeking attention that, that they cut themselves or that, or that they seek that attention. And we see that this man was running around cutting himself and he, the Bible says he was screaming, probably yelling in tongues. I mean, this guy was a maniac. Not the guy that you'd want to be hanging around with. Not the guy that you'd want your kids around. I mean, he was not a friendly guy. We see in verse 5, it says, And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and he worshipped him. Can I tell you tonight, that's the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when, when Jesus comes by your life, Something should be different tonight, amen? When God, when God comes into your life, you ought to be different. You know, we see a man crazy, demon-possessed, but when he saw Jesus, he stopped everything to worship him. You know, it's amazing. I, I always tell uh, the teenagers in our youth group, and I think my wife and I, we are talking about it today, but, you know, 15, 15 minutes of your day is 1% of your day. And you know, we say we love God, we say we're Christians, but we can't even give God 1% of our day. We can't even read our Bible for 15 minutes, we can't even pray for 15 minutes. You know, we, we, we get in this groove, we get in this mindset of, well, I pray rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, you know, before my meal. And that, that's not sufficient. Praying for my food, praying for five minutes a day doesn't give me the walk with God that I need. It just doesn't. And we say we love God, but we don't give God time. And it's interesting that we see that the moment that this man saw Jesus, his life was changed forever. And you know, we have a lot of Christians today, church family, myself included sometimes, where we're saved and we know who God is and we, we attend church, but you couldn't tell. You couldn't tell that we're Christians. You couldn't tell that we're saved because we don't live like it. You couldn't tell because we don't act like Christians. We don't talk like Christians. We don't walk like Christians. And can I tell you that that's why it's so important for us to stay in the Word. That's why it's so important for us to stay in church. Because how am I supposed to live differently if I'm not learning how to do it? How am I supposed to live differently if I'm not reading my Bible to figure out what God says? But can I tell you tonight that when Jesus passes by, he changes everything. Jesus passed by my way, and he made me whole that day. Just a sinner was I, but then Jesus passed by. And oh, what a change in my life since Jesus passed by. Can I tell you, your life's different. It's okay to be different. You know, we, we live in a world where, you know, it's, it's weird to be different, isn't it? I tell you what, the looks that my wife gets wearing a skirt, I tell you what, I tell you what, you would, you would think that she, she's, out, she's out of this world weird. 
But I can tell you, man, that's a good testimony, isn't it? I might tell you, well, I can't tell you the countless times where we've been out, we've been doing something, and, and someone says, why, sir, why, why, are you in a, why are you in a tie? Why is your wife wearing a dress? I say, well, let me tell you. I say, we're, we're Christians. I say, we go to a good Baptist church, and, and these are our standards. This is what the, how we feel the Bible says that we should dress. And you know what it does? It opens a door. It opens a door for me to tell somebody about Jesus. But you know, that door won't open if I'm not living like a Christian. It's interesting, huh? That door's not going to open if I'm not different. But we see here that when Jesus was afar off, he ran and worshipped him. I want you to read verse 7 with, uh, excuse me, follow along with me in verse 7. It said, and cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God. Thou that thou torment me not, for he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. We could uh, continue to read tonight, but you know we know the story that Jesus cleanses this man of the unclean spirit, and he casts it to a herd of swine. Those swine run into the body of water, and they choke and die. And then I want you to jump down with me to, to verse 16. Excuse me, let's go to verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed for, with the devil, and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They were afraid. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because didn't God just, excuse me, didn't Jesus just heal this man of his unclean spirit? And the Bible says that he was sitting in his right mind. He's like any of us sitting here tonight. And the Bible says that they were still afraid. Wait a minute. Why? Is it because Jesus performed such an amazing and unheard of miracle that they couldn't believe it? Look at the next verse there. It says that they saw that it was told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of the coast. They were so afraid they began to beg Jesus, get this guy out of here. I mean, get lost. You know, we don't want you here. What's going on? They didn't want him there before. And now that he's clothed in his right mind, they still don't want him there. Verse 18, and when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil, prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but say, saith unto him, Go home to tell thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath compassion on thee. Now we see that this man, he's being, you know, nobody wanted him in, in his own country. They said, Get out of here, get lost. Jesus, take him with you. We don't want him. And Jesus looks at this man, he says, No, you know, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to go back to your own country. He said, everybody that you come in contact with, I want you to tell them about what I did for you. He said, you think you can do that? The guy kind of scratched his head. He said, you know what? I think I could do that. That sounds pretty easy. He said, Jesus said, okay, I'll be back in, in due time, but I want you to go, and I want you to tell everybody about what I did for you. The next verse says, and he departed, and began to publish in Catapolis uh, how great things Jesus had done for him and what? All men did marvel. You know, you know what I see tonight? I see that one man made the difference. I see one man made a difference in his own country. Picture this with me tonight. Uh, picture with me your friendly neighborhood homeless man. Okay? Probably, you know, really long hair, really long beard, you know, re really not put together, raggedy clothes, smells funny, Right, and just walking around, just got saved. And he says, okay. He said, Jesus has given me this job. And, you know, my mom always told me when I was a kid, all right, you got one job, right? So when I got one job, you know, how could I mess it up, right? How could I mess this up? And so he had one job. And so he goes, and, you know, obviously if I was homeless, I, I would probably lay it out like this, okay? I'm hungry, right? It's been a long time since I had a meal, and I'm hungry. And so I go to the gourmet of any uh, Bible college student, and I go to McDonald's. And I, come on now, and I go to McDonald's, I say, you know what, give me that Big Mac, that number one meal, give me a large fry, give me a large Coke with no ice. Amen? And as the cashier's ringing him up, he begins to tell her, say, hey, have you, have you heard of this man named Jesus? Yeah, he, I, yeah I'm, the, I'm that maniac. And she looks at him and says, Wow, you're him? And he begins to witness to her, and she gets saved. Well, he enjoys his Big Mac meal, and he, he kind of 
you know, feels his face and he's wiping his face off. He said, man, you know, if I'm ever going to go to Bible college, I really got to shave this beard. I can't have it. And so he goes to the barber shop and he says, hey, give me the Baptist boy's haircut, right? Give me the best one you got. And so he goes and, you know, the barber's lining him up really nice and, and he's shaving his beard for him and, you know, he's giving him the gel and while the barber's doing all this for him, he says, hey, do you know about that, that Jesus fella? He changed my life and he can change yours too. And he begins to witness, man, this, this man gets, gets saved. Pretty cool, huh? Well, now he's all fresh cut and he looks around and he says, you know what, these... Man, these clothes are all ragged, aren't they? You know what? I'm going to go to men's warehouse, and I'm going to have them measure me, you know, measure my pant size, measure my suit size. I tell you what, I'm going to get me a nice suit. And so he goes to men's warehouse, and the tailor's measuring him, and he begins to tell him about Jesus. And he tells him about Jesus. He tells him what God did for him, and that man gets saved. And we could go on and on, but the Bible says that this man, everywhere he went, just telling everybody about Jesus. How convicting is that, huh? You say, well, how do you know that? That's not in the Bible. You're right. It's not. But we can assume that it is. Look at two chapters ahead. Look at chapter 7, if you will. I want you to look at verse 31. This story of Jesus healing the deaf and the dumb man. But I want you to notice the words here in verse 31 of chapter 7. It says, And again, departing into the coast of Tyre and Sidon, and he came unto the Sea of Galilee, through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf, an impediment of his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon him. Verse 33, and he took him aside from the what? Multitude. I don't know if you know what that means, but that means there was a lot of people there. And put his fingers in his ears, and he spit and touched his tongue. Now let's break down the story. They bring this deaf and dumb man to Jesus, and they say, hey, can you heal this guy? And Jesus says, I think I can do that. I mean, Jesus gave this guy a wet willy. And he gave him a wet willy and he could hear. Come on, no one else thinks this is crazy. I mean, the Bible says he spit and touched his tongue, put his fingers in his ears. Man, isn't, that's the power of Christ, isn't it? But we see that there wasn't just one guy there. No, no, no. The Bible says that there was a multitude. The Bible says that there was a lot of people there. And I can assume by reading two chapters before that the only reason there could be a multitude there is because of one man. I can assume that the reason that there's a lot of people there is because one man went around telling a lot of people about Jesus Christ. And because one man made the difference in his country a multitude of people got saved. Isn't that a great thought? You know, we look at this guy, and we look at a guy that was, uh, you know, feared. I mean, he was in the, the, the graveyard. He was cutting himself. He was homeless. And God turned around and used him to reach a whole country for Christ. And I often think of my life, and I think, you know, if God can do that with this guy, I wonder what God could do with me. I'm nobody special. You're nobody special tonight. But you know what God's looking for? He's looking for a willing vessel. He's looking for somebody that says, you know what, God, I'm not special. I'm not perfect. Maybe I'm not the most spiritual person out there. But you know what, God, I'm willing to be used. And if you'll use me, then I'll do something for you. You know what, this man, he wasn't special. He wasn't anybody in particular, but he wanted to be used by God. And you know what, maybe at Lighthouse Baptist Church, just maybe God might be looking for somebody to use. You say, well, I'm, I'm too young. I'm too old. You know, I, I, don't, I, I don't have that talent. I don't have that ability. You know, I, I, I briefly gave my testimony this morning, and I kind of dabbled with it, but to, to make a long story short, uh, both of my parents uh, passed away very surprisingly while I was in Bible college, exactly one year apart. Uh, but as my mom got up in age, uh, you know, I'm not going to say how old she was because some of you might feel offended, but uh, it was a joke, okay? <laughs> she, was, she was getting up there to where her health, she could not do 
uh, the things that she had used to. And so she had went to my pastor and she, she said, you know what, pastor, I, I can't do the things that I used to do in church. She said, I'm really going to have to step aside from, from some of these ministries. However, you, you know, I, I can do some hospitality. If you, if you give me a list of, of people that weren't in church last Sunday, uh, I'll go through it and I'll write them all notes. And, you know, if I feel good enough, I'll drop by their house and, and tell them that we missed them. And so, sure enough, pastor gave her a list. And I tell you what, you think a lot of people miss church until you get a list. I mean, I think she was a little overwhelmed. I think, man. You know, some of you, you know, don't miss church, especially for some, somebody that's got to do all those calls and all those letters, and just be here. It's easier that way, right? And, and she gets this list, and sure enough, she, she's writing cards, and she's baking cookies, and, you know, the, the Bible called shooting me and was like, Mom, I want a cookie. She said, no, don't touch those. They're not for you. I said, you don't love me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sacrificing my life for the Lord. No, I'm just kidding. I was like, give me a cookie. And she said, no, they're not for you. I said, well, who are they for, Mom? She said, they're for the people that weren't in church last Sunday. I said, so all I got to do is skip church? I get, no, I'm just kidding. I can get cookies if I'm not in church, amen? That sounds like a good deal to me. No. And so she would, she would take those cookies, she would take a card, and, and she would go and she would knock on their door, and, and she would give them these cookies. And she would give them a note and say, hey, you know what? We, we really missed you last Sunday. And, you know, there's nothing more convicting than an elderly lady and say, hey, why weren't you in church on Sunday? <laughs> right? I mean, I saw the look on some of their faces. I'm like, brother, you think it's bad when the pastor says it. I mean, man, she said, well, where were you last night? She said, oh we, oh, we got busy. And she said, oh, too busy for, I mean, for the Lord. And I mean, she was hardcore. I'll tell you what. And she said, oh, you're, you're too busy to, to give us, to give the Lord a Sunday. And I remember she, she knocked on a door one day. And I would, I would go with her. It was pretty cool to see. But she knocked on the door and this younger couple answered. And she had the cookies, and she had a card in her hand, and, and she said, hi, my, my name's Becky, and, and I'm from the church, and, and I noticed that you weren't there last Sunday. And, and the, the young mom said, oh, oh, come in, come in. And so they began talking, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm a very impatient person by nature, okay? Uh, it, it's very clear to me that, you know, I'm the kind of guy when I shop, I'm in and out in five minutes, guys, come on, right? I know what I want. Bless God, if I'm in there, all right, we're going to go by the list. And my wife's like, oh, this is cute. This is nice. This is pretty. You know, grab 10 things, put them all back, grab one. I'm like, sister, please help me. And my wallet. No, I'm and I'm a very impatient person. I'm sitting there, and my spirit is just like, man, uh, is, this, is this over yet? You know, the average visit, mother, is five minutes, and you're 25 minutes in, okay? And she began talking to him, and, man, they began to build a relationship. But watching my mom... You know, stage four breast cancer. And just say, you know what? I can't do much, but I'm going to do something. And that, that couple later, when, when they did come to church, they got saved. They got baptized, and, and they were joining the church. And as they were uh, joining the church, I tell you what, my mo the look on my mom's face was ju just pure joy. Well, I, I was privileged enough to preach my own mother's funeral. And I tell you what, uh, that, that was a blessing for me. And, and I remember standing uh, uh, in the line, and, and we're doing the viewing of, of the casket, and everybody's walking by. I remember watching this young couple come. And this young couple came by, and just tears in their eyes, they began to tell me, say, you know, I don't think we'd be in church today had your mom not come visit us that day. She, they said, we're, we were really struggling. You know, we, we didn't know if, if church was for us. We didn't know if this Christianity thing was for us. But when your mom came by, she really showed us that people care. She really showed us that God cared. I remember standing there and just thinking, wow, one person made a difference in, the, in this family. Nobody special. I mean, I tell you what, she, just a small petite lady that just wanted to do something for God. And she made a difference in a family. Can I ask you tonight, how can you make a difference in the Christian life? You know, you can do the smallest thing. You can write a note to somebody in your church. You, you, you can uh, make cookies for somebody. You can go pick up the elderly, take them shopping. You can go have a Bible study with somebody in your church at Pete's, not Starbucks. Don't go to Starbucks, go to Pete's, amen? <laughs> Pete's is better anyways, all right? <laughs> and, you know, go to Pete's, have a Bible study with somebody. 
uh, where I've, uh, we just started this discipleship program in, a, in our church. And, and so I decided, you know what, I'm going to pick a teenage boy in our church, and we're going to go through this discipleship. And so, you know, we're, we're uh, doing four weeks. We're doing eternal security. Uh, we're doing baptism. We're doing the Word of God. And, and we're going through. And I tell you what, uh, this, he's a very, very confused young man. I tell you what, when we talk, I mean, he's like, well, you know, I believe, I think the NIV is good. I think, I tell you what, I throw out whatever 180 something versions there are. I've got the one for you, buddy. And I mean, he's just got all these questions. And I know what, I think I learn more discipling him, Pastor, than he probably learns from me. I'm a knucklehead. And you know what, I'm just, we're just going through Bible study together. But you know what, I'm hoping that that'll make a difference in his Christian life. I hope he'll learn some things about God's word. I hope he'll learn about eternal security. Right? Once saved, always saved. I hope to learn about baptism. The baptism doesn't save you. Right? And it's just an, an outward profession of an inward possession. Right? I hope he'll learn some of these things. And I hope it makes a difference in his life. My challenge to you tonight is simple as I wrap up. What can you do to make a difference? What can you do to make a difference in, in the lives of others? Can you drive a bus? And can you pick some kids up? And I tell you what, yesterday we were out soul winning and in Seaside, Seaside, California, and, and I love Seaside. I tell you what, you get, give me an apartment building and give me a bus, and I'll find, I'll find some people that want to come to church, all right? I tell you what, the harvest truly is plenteous. Laborers are few. We need people that want to do the ministry. I remember uh, yesterday I knocked on this door with my brother-in-law. We knocked on this door, and this kid was playing FIFA. And I tell you what, I don't know a lick about soccer, and I'm not even going to pretend to, okay? But if it means bringing somebody to church, I'll try. And I remember like, hey, man, you play FIFA? I do too, like once a year. No, I'm kidding. I play sometimes. And he's telling me all these soccer players. I'm like, buddy, I'm lost. <laughs> you want to come to church, though? I remember just talk, we talked for 20 minutes about something that I could care less about. I, I could give a flying flip about soccer. But you know what? He loved soccer. And you know what? If, if that means down the road that he'll come to church, I, I'll talk about soccer all day. It's not about me. The ministry is not about me and it's not about you, it's about God. It's about bringing other people into God's house. You know, there's empty seats here tonight that could be filled if one person would decide that they want to make a difference. Every time I go to a church, every time I preach at a church, I see empty seats. I'll tell you what, I get convicted. You know, because there's always room for more. There's always room for more, right? There's always a place for somebody. You know, I, I love church because... We get all walks of life, all different kinds of people, and we all come together for the same common goal, for the same reason. And we all come together because we love God, we want to worship Him, and we want to grow. This is the household of faith, isn't it? In the household of faith, there is love we employ. In the household of faith, there is peace we enjoy. I tell you what, there's no better place in God's house. How are you going to make a difference this year? you got a new theme, a great theme. I tell you what, a great, a great pastor with an amazing vision. But that vision is all, only going to work if God's people will jump in. If God's people will jump in and say, hey, you know, I can't do much, but pastor, what can I do? I can cut the grass. I can, I can mow the lawn. I could uh, come in here. Do you have a list of people I can visit? And when we decide that, hey, I'm going to make a difference, you know what God's going to do? God's going to do great things. And I'll wrap up with this. There, there's a story in the book of Matthew where Jesus goes back to his home country of Nazareth. And he goes back to his home country of Nazareth. No doubt he wanted to do great things. But you know what the Bible says? He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And if you don't think that God's going to do great things in your life, if you don't think God's going to do great things in your church, then guess what? Shocker, he won't. Because you don't have faith that he will. And if we have faith that God can do great things in our church and in our life, he will. How can you make a difference? How can you make a difference in your church? How can you make a difference in your life? How can you make a difference in the life of others? God, thank you uh, for this message. God, I pray that you'd bless this invitation. Uh, God, as pastor, would lead it in your name. Amen. Let's stand to our feet while the piano plays. God spoke into your heart from this message about a challenge to do. Let God make a difference through one soul. One person can make a difference. The invitation is open. You can come to the altar, do some business with God. Do it right there at your pew, but do be sensitive. Prepared unto every good work, each of us, individuals.
different people, different backgrounds, God use. praying would you come maybe there's somebody you need to pray for God's put them on your mind and on your heart and you need to go after them in love and compassion but get them the gospel as a demon possessed man because of what God had done for him he went and told others certainly there's something you can tell somebody how God has blessed you and saved you surrender all is what she's prayed.